Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Radio Networks on Saturday, August 27th, 2011. This is episode 799. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, has been gravely ill, uh, originally with pancreatic cancer, uh, most recently with uh, liver cancer. Um... His, um, his medical uh, prognosis seems to have gotten worse, although they're not talking about it. He had a liver transplant last year. Came back to work. So, so, so in the past, even though gravely ill, he hasn't quit. He stayed in the, in the saddle. Took a leave of absence, let his uh, number two man, T uh, Tim Cook, the COO, the chief operating officer, run the day-to-day -day while he got better. But then he came back. But this letter he sent on Thursday doesn't, it, it, it's what put me in the kind of elegiac mood. To the Apple board of directors in the Apple community. I've always said that if there ever came a day, Steve wrote, when I could no longer meet my duties and expectations as Apple's CEO, I would be the first to let you know. Unfortunately, that day has come. I hereby resign as CEO of Apple. I would like to serve if the board sees fit as chairman of the board, director, and Apple employee. As far as my successor goes, I strongly recommend that we execute our succession plan and name Tim Cook as CEO of Apple. Both of those things, by the way, happened. Steve is chairman of the board. He's on the board of directors, remains an Apple employee, and Tim Cook is the CEO. He goes on to write, I believe Apple's brightest and most innovative days are ahead of it. And I look forward to watching and contributing to its success in a new role, implying he's going to be around. But then, and this is the thing that kind of choked me up, this last sentence of the, of the letter. I've made some of the best friends of my life at Apple, and I thank you all for the many years of being able to work alongside you. Steve. Uh, my suspicion, and I'm sure everybody thinks this, although something you don't want to say out loud is that Steve's health has taken a turn for the worse and he wants to spend uh, the rest of his uh, time however long that may be with family and friends but you you know that somebody like Steve Apple was his life and so saying goodbye in such a final way to day-to-day -day operations at Apple uh, is really I think in a way saying yeah it's it's time for me to prepare for the next stage in my journey and, and I, uh, it's uh, devastating news for those of us who uh, have been watching Steve Jobs for the last three decades create a company that is unparalleled in the history, not only of technology, but of industry in general. He is a Henry Ford. He is a Bill Gates. And in many ways towers above even them with his innovative skills, his, his artistic vision, and his willingness to accept nothing but the absolute best from himself, his employees, uh, and from his company. And he did that. And he, you can absolutely say, and again, I'm, I'm not writing his eulogy. I'm just putting a coda on his career at Apple. You can absolutely say that since Apple was founded 35 years ago, uh, Steve Jobs has... Not single-handedly, he's had many, many great people work for him, starting with Steve Wozniak. But, but even Steve Wozniak will say that, that the, the genius that made Apple what it is it was, all, was Steve Jobs. He put the team together. He took products that were not in and of themselves innovations necessarily. The Apple II wasn't the first personal computer. The iPod wasn't the first MP3 player. The iPhone wasn't the first smartphone. 
the iPad was not the first tablet. And yet, in every way, the products he created, invented, created, and, and made a category. He was the first to take the personal computer and make it ours. He was the first to take MP3 players and make them usable. He was the first to put smartphones in, in virtually everyone's pocket. And of course, with iTunes, he transformed the music industry. It, really an amazing man with an amazing vision and genius. And uh, I, know, I know we're not saying goodbye to Steve Jobs, the man, but we will miss him in the technology industry. Truly an amazing fellow in many ways. And, and, and like many uh, great industrialists and innovators, an iconoclast, a guy who could just make you so angry, <laughs> a guy who, could, who, who came off as very arrogant. The little time I spent with him, it was very clear. He knew that he was the smartest guy in the room. There was just no question in his mind. And you know what? He probably was. I don't think there's any question about it. And, and if you ask, well, what is Apple going to be like with Steve Jobs, or the, without Steve Jobs? And the only, the only example we've had is those few years that he, he was forced out of Apple Computer by John Scully. And Apple wandered in the wilderness for years. Jobs went off to found Next Computer and then to take a little company called Pixar and put it on the map. Came back to Apple about, what is it, 11 now, years, 12 years ago. A company that was almost bankrupt, that was... I would say months away from folding and turned it into perhaps the most valuable company in the world today. Truly amazing. Truly amazing. 8888 Ask Leo is the phone number. And yes, there are definitely negatives, but I don't think this is the time to talk about the negatives of Steve Jobs. He's quite a character, but you know what? It takes a certain amount of arrogance and will and power to do what he did. You can't do it... Uh, I don't think you can do it and be a nice guy at the same time. And in many ways, he was a nice guy, but not always a nice guy. 8888 Ask Leo, if you'd like to talk about that, we can. 888-8275-536. We've got James DeRuvo with his uh, quill pen scribbling away at the Tech Guy Labs website, techguylabs.com. Did we, uh, Colin, launch the new Twit website? Is that... Uh, we're going to launch it right after, after the show tomorrow, we're going to launch it once the weekend traffic dissipates. So... We've redesigned the podcast page, twit.tv. Now, the next project, once we launch that, I hate to say this, Colin, because Colin, <laughs> Colin's the guy who spearheaded the Twit page, along with a, a company in Vancouver called ImageX Media that did a great job. You'll see that page. You can go see it now if you want to beta. Should I say it? Yeah. It's okay? Yeah, it's fine. We can send a million people there. It won't go down? Yeah, I warned Chris. And, uh, you warned Bear and Chris, the sysadmins, that we would be going to beta.twit.tv. Not finished, almost finished. You can take a look at it if you want, uh, there. Um, but it'll be going live uh, on Monday. But the reason I mention that is because as soon as that goes live, we start to work on the new Tech Guy site. And I know, I know I've been saying this for a long time. I know practically as long as I've been doing the show, I've been saying we need a better website. We have one now, techguylabs.com. I encourage you to go there. You have links to the chat room, links to the video, links to all the previous show, and, of course, James DeRuvo's great show notes. And we are working on a better site, which we'll have out probably by the end of the year. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Be a good time to tell you a little bit about Netflix. What was I watching on Netflix last night? Oh, man. I just, I am such a huge fan of, uh, of Netflix anyway. And for a long time, I did the DVDs. I still have the DVDs gathering dust under my TV. I don't need to do it really so much anymore because now I've got Netflix uh, streaming. It, well, we all do. Seven dollars ninety nine cents a month. I'm I'm gonna. I don't know. I think I might turn off the discs. This is so great. So many great movies, always available. And you just you don't have to plan ahead. You just think about it. Not just movies, TV shows. Love Arrested Development. I'm gonna go back through through, through the the old Arrested Development series. Such a good show, wasn't it? Wonder how many. I wonder how many episodes they have on here. Oh, all three seasons. So that's. Season 1, 22 episodes. Season 2, another 18. That makes 40. 53 episodes. That should keep me busy for a while. The thing about this, when you do, when you do uh, TV shows this way, it's like eating candy. You just can't stop at just one. You just... <laughs> hey, it's so good. Mad Men is on there now. My daughter and son just watch Family Guy just from beginning to end. There's like 18, I don't know how many, 100 shows on there. 
Glee. You got little kids? Great for little kids because this streaming is not just on your TV. It's on your iPad, your iPhone, um, 24 different Android phone models, Windows Mobile. So it's great on these portable devices. Of course, your Xbox 360, your PlayStation 3, your Nintendo Wii, pretty much anywhere you can stream now. I love it. $7.99 a month. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir. You're all Netflix customers already, right? Of course you are. But if you're not, you can try it free for 30 days. Netflix.com slash twit. And do me a favor. If you if you like the radio show, you like you want to support the Tech Guy podcast, if you listen to the podcast, and you're already a member of Netflix, tell a friend, family member. They'll thank you. 30 days free. Netflix. Dot com slash twit. And we thank you for your support. Some great stuff on here. Now the Ralph Nader bio. I, I, I like to read the, uh, watch the documentaries. Because these are things you don't even see in the theater. Lots of great documentaries. You feel like you've, you've learned something in there. Understated 20th century period pieces based on a book. Talk about a category. Netflix.com slash twit. Leo Laporte, hello, hello, you say goodbye, I say hello. That's appropriate. Of course, you know Steve Jobs, huge Beatles fan. In fact, I, th I, I truly think that getting the Beatles on iTunes, which only happened a few months ago, in some ways was one of the things Steve wanted to do before he retired. I'm sure. Do you think somebody like a, a Steve Jobs has a bucket list? Things I'm going to do before I retire. Get the Beatles on iTunes. Build a giant spaceship office building in Cupertino, California. <laughs> Beat Bill Gates at bridge. I don't know. He's got a list. Have you seen the uh, building that the Apple is, uh, is going to build now? And, and uh, Cupertino is, is, is where Apple's always been. It's where Steve and uh, Woz grew up as kids in high school, met in high school. Did their first business. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. You know what their first business was? Selling blue boxes. Those are the uh, those are the, the the devices that hackers use to hack, or used to use to hack the phone system for free long distance calls. Waz would make them. Steve would sell them. Waz tells the story. Uh, <laughs> I love it too. He said every time I'd invent something, I'd bring it to Steve, and Steve said we could make a business out of this. That tells you something about Steve Jobs. He wasn't the electronics whiz, although he was good. I mean, he, he soldered uh, those boards along with the uh, Waz in the garage. I mean, he was there. But, but he wasn't the genius at inventing that Waz was. But he sure knew how to productize, to make something a great product, and to push the inventors until they made something truly awe-inspiring, or as he would say, insanely great. That was that. That's a skill. In our chat room, somebody's saying Jobs was a car salesman. Well, if he was a car salesman, he was selling the best. <laughs> he was the best darn car salesman I've ever seen. He was a salesman. He was a marketer. I mean, there's no doubt those amazing keynote speeches that he gave were the best marketing in history. The fact that the rumors that would, would, would go around as Apple prepared one of those keynotes, the rumors that are going on today about when is Apple going to release the next iPhone? Is it going to be September? No, no, it's going to be October. I heard it's going to be October. No, it's going to be September. Those, I mean, you can't buy that kind of press. Everybody's talking about what's Apple going to do next. And that you can point squarely at Steve Jobs. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone number. Let's see, Mike is in Los Angeles, our first call of the day. Uh, Mike, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo, how are you? Wonderful, how are you, Mike? Uh, I've got an AV receiver that's about four years old and uh, hooked up to my uh, TV and my DVD. Now, I put it on mute, took it off of mute, and then no sound. Uh -oh. I unplugged it, tried everything. Still, no sound coming out of the speakers, not even a hum or anything. What sounds happened? like, well, it sounds like you the blue a fuse. Believe it or not, those AV receivers are fused. Um, you know, I can't. <laughs> I love the faith that you place in me that perhaps somehow I can, with my x ray vision and my supersonic hearing, go through the radio 
into your living room and figure out what's wrong with that AV receiver. But I'm afraid, alas, that I have not quite perfected those abilities yet. I'm trying. Let me see. Uh, no, can't. Mm. My suspicion is, though, and this, is, this does happen, and, and there's a little fuse on the back. You could check and see if that's what happened. Before you do that, though, you know, you might also check the speaker wires and all of that stuff. It, where, what, what I'll use this question for, because I really can't, fi I can't figure it out. I don't know. But what I'll use this question for is kind of a little lesson in troubleshooting. It's really simple. In fact, if you think about it, I'm sure you could come up with this. Troubleshooting is a process of eliminating causes till you narrow it down and, f and figure out what's causing the problem. Sherlock Holmes invented it. Remember he said to Watson, he said, Watson, I eliminate all the possibilities and whatever remains, however unlikely, is the fact, the cause of the matter. It's simple troubleshooting. Now, in my book, the best way to troubleshoot is to start with the easy stuff first. If you have a pretty good idea, like, like in this case, fuse, sounds like the fuse, then maybe go straight to it. But if you don't, start with the easy stuff. Check the wires. Plug them and unplug them. Make sure the power is on on the AV receiver, that it's turned on, things like that. Do the easy stuff first. The cabling, try swapping the cables or plugging into another source, that kind of thing. And after you do the easy things, maybe then check the fuse, pull it out, see if it's there. You can, you can actually usually tell if a fuse is blown. Uh, it looks like, you know, there's a little filament that's burned out. Uh, and then you have to get to the harder stuff. And that's the stuff inside the AV receiver. And now, you know, it's not like a tube receiver. Maybe it is. I don't think it is. If it's a tube receiver, you could actually look at the tubes. But nowadays what you have to do is, is look at the circuit boards. And that's something probably you can't do at home. So try all of those things. Make sure the settings are right. Here's the quote. I'm going to give you the quote because the chat room gave it to me. I like that quote. This is from Sarah Jane, UK. She's British. So she would know. When you have eliminated the impossible, Watson, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Yes, that's of course, that's exactly right. So we've eliminated all the possibilities, and you still don't know what's wrong, and they have to go to the uh, shop and, and check it out. But that's all troubleshooting is, bit by bit. One. The problem is that these computers nowadays, I don't know about AV receivers, but computers are so hideously complex so mind-bogglingly complex that it's impossible often to figure out what all the uh, possibilities are, let alone test them. Norman LaCosta, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Norm. Oh, hi, Leo. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm just uh, checking back in with you. I talked to you last Saturday, and we had, I had a problem with my um, wife's email, Hotmail. Yeah, and I love it when people give me a follow-up because otherwise we kind of... We'll always wonder. So what, 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 what first of all, remind yeah. people what was going on. Okay. The, um, when I would open the email and then I'd want to forward the email onto some other person or, or I would uh, click forward in the screen area <laughs> yeah. where all the email appeared went blank. That was and weird. Yeah. So what was it? You know, actually went, you, you could see the browser at the top and the favorites at the side, but that uh, particular part of the screen where it appeared, uh, should appear, was totally blank. What did that Leo guy tell you to do? I don't remember. The guy told me to uh, download um, uh, per perhaps Windows Live Mail. Uh, I, I, did the ex uh, in I downloaded the Internet Explorer. I redid that. I you, kind of you did that. Okay. Redownloaded it. Good. And you also would, uh, advised me to um, try a new browser like Google Chrome or a Mozilla Fire Firefox. Yeah, and uh, I, hadn't, I didn't go that far because it actually worked once I uh, downloaded uh, Internet Explorer again. Excellent. So it was just Internet Explorer was a little confluggered. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I don't know why, but uh, yeah, because I tried many things in front of it and never thought that the program would have a glitch in it. It's nice to be able to get your email in a browser, but I would just still go to get.live.com. That's the Windows Live uh, software, and they'll give you. Uh, you'll download a little thing that'll say, well, here's all the programs. Which ones do you want? You check them. Windows Live Mail is uh, Microsoft's replacement for Outlook Express. It's really good. And you can still use the browser when you want to, but I really like it, so I'd recommend it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I'm going to add that to the list of things I should have told my mom. My mother lives in Rhode Island, as does my sister. 
right smack dab in the uh, right on the uh, waterfront too right smack dab in the eye of the storm irene of course heading uh, north now as it's uh, going through north carolina up to manhattan and uh then new england and uh and you know a uh, little worried about mom so i called her this morning <laughs> i should have called her last week but i didn't know I called her last morning. I said, oh, hi, Mom. Are you she said, yeah, I'm, I brought in all the lawn furniture. I got the plants in, that, in the house. I, we're going to take the air conditioners out of the window. We're going to put up the storm windows. Yeah, they're prepared. You know, they have, they have pretty bad weather out there, so they're prepared. Not like us Californians. A hurricane here, we would just it'd be all us. Heavy, heavy rain, and, there's, and, and it's all over. We shut down. Uh, I said, well, okay, and so good, but there's a few things I, I hope you have. You got water? She said, oh, yeah, yeah, we're storing up water. I've turned the fridge up high so that when the, because the power will go out. That's, at least, that's a given. When the power goes out, I'll, you know, everything will be really cold. The freezer I've turned up. Okay, good. You got the power. You got the, you got the, uh, you got some food. You got some canned food. Yeah, yeah, you got some dried food. Yeah, yeah, you got some water. Okay. That's good. I said, transistor radio? She said, what's that? I said, you know, remember the old days we had a battery radio, a little thing you hold in your hand? You listen to, you know, Jerry and the pacemakers? She said, no, I don't have that. Oh, Okay. Flashlights, yep. Batteries, yep. Candles, yep. She's got, you know, it's, it's New England, so she's got kerosene lamps. <laughs> she got, she got, she's ready. Good, I said. One more thing, because, you know, I want to be able to reach you. Uh, if the power goes out, I'd still like to be able to reach you. You, you got a, a phone, right, that doesn't plug into the wall, you know, just a regular old-fashioned, what's, the, what do you mean? I said, you know, well, you plug, there's two things. You plug in the phone, you plug the phone into the phone jack and you plug, and then you have a, your phone, because it's a cordless phone, you plug into the power, uh, but you have a phone that doesn't require power. You just plug into the phone jack. She said, no, what's that? I said, don't you remember in the old days, we'd have a rub black rubber phone, right? Western Electric. You'd rent it. You couldn't buy it. You'd rent it. And it'd plug into the wall. She said, oh, no, I don't have one of those. Should I have one? Yes. It's not too late if you're in the um, affected areas. Everybody. In fact, now uh, now that you're thinking about it, everybody should have one of these. You don't even have to plug it in. You know, the old kind, like a princess phone, like the old kitchen phone, anything that plugs into the wall because the phone company will keep that going even if the power goes out. The way that works, a little bit of, tiny little bit of power goes down the phone line from the phone company. And the phone company has generators that'll keep going she said, well, my neighbor has a cell phone. I said, no, Mom, that's the first thing that's going to go. If the power goes out, the cell phones go out. That's the, f that's the first thing that's going to go. In fact, <laughs> the FCC is doing a little investigation. Um, well, I, was, it the, the, was it the tornado? Or I can't remember. I guess it was the tornado. The cell phone system kind of got bogged down by so many call emergency calls. And the FCC is angry. They said, well, these cell phone companies... People are relying on this, on this for emergencies. You shouldn't fail the, the minute somebody, you know, because of congestion, the minute people start using it. So they're investigating. I mean, we, it's probably not a good idea to rely on cell phones. Get yourself one of those phones that's, that are not powered. They just go into the wall. A battery-powered transistor radio. She said, well, I, the neighbors have cell phones. They'll knock on my door if there's an evacuation. I said, Mom, <laughs> those, those, oh, dear. Oh dear! Oh dear! Oh dear! And we'll get we'll get her one. Uh, <laughs> I wonder if Amazon delivers in hurricanes. But it's it, the, the problem is that it, it's too late now to plan, right? You, you you need to do this now. So if you're at home and maybe this is your get out and about on a Saturday afternoon, and you're you're going to do some shopping, go on over to the Radio Shack or the hardware store. Get one of those old fashioned phones that just plugs into the wall. That's a good thing to have. Transistor radio, disaster packs. There's lots of things you can do. But you know your internet's gone when the power's gone. And your cell phone's gone when the power's gone. And uh, make friends with a ham. That's, not an, that's another good idea. Because the ham radio, you know, this is, uh, this is when ham radio leaps into action. They, uh, the, the, the hams that are part of the emergency services sectors, and quite a few of these in the ham radio community, all will have generators or battery backup. They'll have ways that they can communicate even when nothing else, including the telephone, works. Greg in Glendora, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Greg. Hey, how you doing? I am well. Hand crank jobby. Hand crank. You love it. Yes, you know, you can get a hand cranked radio. The, the, the Gizwiz, our gadget guy, loves these things. I don't know why he's got a disaster mentality, but he'd crank them up. 
they have flashlights that you power. They have a radio in there. That's a great idea. Yeah. Oh, but I got I got a little miniature problem. You're gonna love it. All right. I, I'm with I'm I'm with Time Warner, and and Time Warner Cable, and I'm trying to decide: should I take their virus protection, or should I stick with my Nod 32? Stick stick with Nod 32. Cable companies nowadays, ISPs, most computers, they all come with trial versions. Uh, sometimes completely free versions, usually of McAfee or Norton. Uh, I hate those. I hate them. <laughs> me too. <laughs> me too. You and me both, dude. So, uh, I, yeah, if you've already purchased Nod32, do not take the free antivirus. The truth is, even Microsoft's free antivirus, Microsoft Security Essentials, is superior to either Norton or McAfee. I don't like either of those. They slow you down. They're just not great. My, if, you, if you're cheap and you don't want to buy something, Microsoft Security Essentials is fine. It's, it's uh, Microsoft.com slash Security Essentials. You have to have a recent version of Windows to use that. And uh, if you want to buy it, you know I love Nod32. They're a sponsor, but they're really, they're really the one I recommend. It's very lightweight. It's very effective. So, yeah, I'd get rid of uh, Just because your ISP gives you something doesn't mean that's what you should use. They make a deal, you know. Let's go to Menifee, California. Larry on the line. Hi, Larry. Hey, good morning, Leo. Uh, good morning. What can I do for you? Well, I'll tell you. I, I've been pulling out my hair. Uh, let's see. I got a few left. Uh, oh, and by the way, I'm a veteran ham of 42 years. Yeah, and so you know this story. I mean, that really is where hams leap into action. The uh, emergency frequency for the hurricane is on 20 meters. It's 14.325. You know how I know that? How's that? Kilo 9, Echo India Delta, Mr. Bob Hiles in our chat room, and he's telling us. So 14.325 if you're a ham, or if, even if you, if you just have a shortwave radio, you can listen on 20 meters. You can hear the emergency communications going on. Excellent. Hey, Bob. Okay. <laughs> you know Bob? Oh, yeah. Who, who doesn't know Bob? He's the most famous, I'm discovering the most famous ham in America. <laughs> and there's you and uh, several. <laughs> oh, just a mini ham. Somebody sent me a note saying, how dare you call yourself a ham? Oh, and my sister just passed her tech too. So yeah, she, I gotta. Yeah. I think. I think you know. It's. It's never been easier to become an amateur radio operator. The test is easy. You don't have to learn Morse code anymore, and uh, you can get these little handy talkies. And uh, and uh, boy, it's great. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, her uh, her uh, suffix is QDS, Quick Draw Sue. <laughs> Did she apply for that, or she just got it? She got it, you know, but when she goes for her general, she's going to uh, uh, acquire my dad's uh, mm. old. Uh, he passed away in 97, so we're going to resurrect that call and uh, oh, carry it. Isn't that a nice idea? Oh, yeah. I love that idea. So there you go. Well, what can I do for you today, Larry? Well, I'll tell you. My sister gave me this laptop that... And then I took my old Pentium 4, reformatted it, and gave it to her husband, who now has my old computer, just as happy as can be. Great. And I updated it to this i3. I would have got an i5, but hey, listen, you know, it's better than what I had. Well, if you think about it, you went from a Pentium 4 to an i3. That's like, uh, you know, 21st century, baby. That's, you're, you're, you're doing fine. Yeah, so I'm, I'm basically using it as a, uh, as, a, as a desktop with portability. Uh, I have low vision. So I plugged it in via HDMI to DVI to my ViewSonic 22-inch monitor. All right, hold on. We're going to hear the rest of the story in a moment. We've got to take a little break here, okay? Hey. Thank you, Larry. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's actually a little scary, isn't it? Watching the coverage, the... Uh, Hurricane coverage on CNN, and it's just, it's a little scary. So uh, we wish you all the best, and uh, for our friends in the, the in Eastern, on the Eastern Seaboard, uh, take care, please. The good thing about uh, radio, though, it, it cuts right through that, doesn't it? Love it. Love it. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the number, 888-827-5536. Website, techguylabs.com. Larry and Manaphy is uh, on the line, and... He's got a he's got a strange problem with his monitor. Yes, I do. So tell me tell me again, how does this happen? Okay, what what happens, Leo, is I'll be watching the monitor 
and usually if I go into like Windows Media Center, uh, it always does this. It'll just go blank for like two or three seconds and come back, and it might do it again. Yeah, that's and, that's normal when you're doing something like going into Windows Media Center because the monitor is changing its resolution. Okay, but then my wife can be, um, you know, cruising the net and stuff, and then it'll just go blank. Or if she's playing a game, it'll just go blank and then come back. You know, and it's very annoying. And I've, I was on uh, with tech support for HP for uh, several times, and they said, oh, well, just... Before you send it in, which I don't want to be without this thing for three weeks, you know, I mean, that's like the last thing I want to do, uh, is to just do a total system restore. Yeah. Just I, do it. Yeah, I don't. Okay, this is, let me tell you why they do this. This is for their convenience, not yours. Exactly. <laughs> they, the problem is, and it's, I completely understand it, is it's very difficult to troubleshoot a computer if you don't know what software, what drivers, all that stuff are on there. They know, of course, if you go back to the way it was when it came from the factory, then they know. They say, well, you know, we know exactly what's running on there. And that's what they need to do for their purposes to determine whether it's a software problem or a hardware problem. It could be a hardware problem. It could be a video card problem or a, a cable problem or a monitor problem. But they can't be sure unless they get your software into a, a known state. So that's why they say re reinstall. Now, that isn't necessarily the best thing for you. No. It's a lot of work. And it may not, <laughs> it may not solve the problem. Right. And, and so here I am with a HDMI going to my DVI input on my... Uh, so this only happens when you're going to a big screen TV, or does it happen on the computer monitor as well? Oh, no, that's what I'm using as the 22-inch ViewSonic. And, um, okay, so you're, so not, you're not hooking up to a TV. But w so what's the HDMI story then? Oh, the HDMI is the uh, output of the uh, laptop. So you're not hooking up the laptop to the monitor via the monitor connection. You're using HDMI. Correct. Yeah, I think that's probably related to your issue. Really? Because now I don't see the problem if I got you know both displays you know going at the same time. It won't go out on the laptop display, but it will on the monitor display. And uh, yeah, going HDMI. Yeah, to, that's right. <laughs> So you're saying it's not happening on the laptop, only on this external monitor? No, you know. So yeah, it's going on on the. DVI. So what's happening is it, it's it's yeah. I don't think this is broken. <laughs> this is kind of normal. Okay, because I I do have a VGA, but the VGA on the on on the laptop is so cheesy. It's almost flush mount with no screws and yeah. It's like, like no, HD, you, HDMI is preferable if you're because it's digital. The VGA is analog, so it is preferable. To using to use the HDMI, you might try swapping the HDMI cable. Um, okay. I mean, I, I ordered this. It's it's a monster one. And I, oh God, you poor fellow! <laughs> I, well, you have my I, deepest sympathy. How much did that monster HDMI cable cost? Oh, about ten dollars. Oh well, that's not bad. Really? I thought monster was much more expensive. Oh, they are, but I got it on uh, Amazon. So yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, because really, the truth is. Uh, an HDMI cable it should be a four or five dollar cable. Monoprice.com. If you, next time, but ten dollars is fine. Okay, so if I were to get another one, well, I mean, you know, like I don't know what kind. Just but... get the cheapest possible. HDMI does not need a fancy cable. Okay. Go to Monoprice.com, or you know, get it on Amazon. Amazon has cheap ones. Go ahead and get. It. I would try another cable. I would before you do that because that's going to take a while. Or while you're waiting for that cable to come. Uh, I would check out the video drivers, make sure you have the latest. I would make sure the refresh settings for the monitor you're using are correct. That often is a problem. It's not unusual on a second monitor to have it te temporarily go dark and come back up. Usually that's a refresh rate reset. Okay, yeah. Uh, that doesn't sound too odd. Uh, okay. You don't want it to happen a lot, but, but certainly when you're switching into Windows Media Center, that's normal. And I and then also I've got it set to the native resolution, you know the uh, for the monitor for the for the ViewSonic. Yeah. 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 yeah you want to make sure both resolution and refresh are, are correct. Okay. Um, make sure you don't have uh, go into your power saving settings. Make sure that the screen blanking is turned off. Screen blanking. Oh yeah, yeah. There's in your uh, if you in your control panel you'll see uh, power settings, 
Uh, you want to make sure that the, just if, at least try this. Set the screen blanking to never. Okay, I, I've never seen that before. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's that's certainly something uh, you might want to check. You know, uh, look in that little uh, little light bulb thing. Okay, because I, I I was reading this morning about well, turn your brightness down. You know, okay. Mm. So, I've 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 tried everything, Leo, and it's just. You know, I'm, I'm usually pretty good at this stuff, but this is really, you know, and I don't, I don't want to let it down until I get it fixed, and until I get it fixed, I, there's no rest, and it's just bugging me, and I want to... <laughs> yeah, I would, I would make sure, because, you know, your screen will sleep. Make sure screen sleep is turned off, for sure. That's in the power settings of your control panel. I, I you know, that's a, that's something certainly to look at. There, again, we're getting back to this troubleshooting thing. It, it's very, there's so many things it could be. Um, I would try all the um, all of the uh, software, you know, checks and fixes first, and then maybe uh, it's not you know five buck cable. It's not bad to have more than one, but uh, then maybe I would uh, look at that. So you go to Control Panel, and uh, if you're using Windows Seven, they have this terrible category thing. I can never find what I want, so I, <laughs> I turn that off. Because then I can see all of the, uh, all of the uh, control panel things as individual things. Now, what do they call it in Windows Seven? It used to be called uh, what was it Power Management? Yeah, power Options. There it is. You go into Power Options. You have to change plan settings because they only have you know two basic plans. Change plan settings, and you'll see a turn off display. You notice I I have it turned to never because. Uh, well, I you know I have other ways to shut it down, or you know you maybe have a screensaver or whatever. But if you're certainly if you're looking at a display to watch TV, you, because when you're watching video, nothing else is happening. If you have it set to turn off the display after 20 minutes, it will it will go blank, even though you're watching TV. So set that to never on a Windows Media Center. Sarkis, Burbank, California. You're next. Hi, Sarkis. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello, Leo. How are you? Wonderful. Thanks for calling. What can I do for you? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for teaching us all kinds of things. I learn everything, I mean, new things every week. Well, you know, it's funny. I do, too. Because <laughs> a lot of times people call and I don't know the answer or the chat room knows. or we talk. So I, the, the best way to learn for me is to do this show. If I stopped doing this show, I'd get ignorant fast. Well, you don't know in the ways you help me. I've got... Uh, Go to my PC, and uh, yes. I was on the other side of the world, and I had to get out documents, and it saved my butt. Isn't that great? Yep. Well, what can I do for you today? Um, I'm launching a website, and I um, need to go to Las Vegas to show, and I need your help in getting um, wireless data access to present my website. And on I will help you. Hang on, okay? We'll come back right after the local news. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, a good day to you. Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. It's time to talk about tech, computers, the Internet, cell phones, camcorders, MP3 players. We've been talking a little bit about the hurricane and disaster preparedness. I mentioned getting a, a phone that doesn't have to plug into the power. So if the power goes out, it'll still work. Phone, people forget we're all using cordless phones now, but those old-fashioned, remember those old Western electric phones? They work just fine, even in a power outage when your cell phone won't. And your, cord and your cordless phone won't. So get one of those old-fashioned phones if you don't have one. Uh, not a bad idea if there's going to be lightning. Not a bad idea to, uh, to unplug your stuff. You may say, well, wait a minute, I'm on a surge suppressor, Leo. I'm, I'm fine. No. If, it's, if, if you get a direct lightning strike, it'll jump right across that surge suppressor and fry your gear. So if, if the storm is headed your way or a storm is headed your way, a thunderstorm, really a good idea. Shut everything down. Shut all the electronics down. Your home theater is even more vulnerable. Turn off your TV, your big screen TV, your AV receiver, and unplug them from the wall. And I mean unplug everything. If you have an Ethernet cable or a modem cable, those are very vulnerable to uh, lightning strikes. Anything that could get in there. And the problem is that solid-state electronics, the chips that run all of these devices, including your home theater apparatus, high, uh, are, are um, easily blown by high voltage. They're very sensitive to that. So uh, it's a good idea if, you've, if you're in the middle of a storm, 
Unplug all that stuff. Shut it down and unplug it. Don't rely on a UPS to protect you. And, you know, many people don't put their home theater stuff on UPSs. These things are vulnerable, maybe some more so than a computer. And in many cases, you've spent a lot more money on that TV. So it might be a good idea to, to get a UPS or some sort of a power protection anyway. But do unplug them if a lightning storm, electrical storm is on your way. Um, does the, you know, make sure you got a good backup off-site. We talked about carbonite, any kind of off-site backup. Worst case, just do a hard drive backup and take that hard drive to work. Not a bad idea. Sometimes the, uh, the surge isn't as bad as the brownout that can follow a power outage or precede a power outage. So what happens often with a power outage is you first get low power. And those can be very, the low power, the brownouts can be very hard on electronics. The power then goes out. And then when it comes back, it often surges on the way back. So best thing to do, just unplug that sucker. 8888 Ask, Leo Larry's in San Francisco, where we never have to worry about anything. Except earthquakes. <laughs> hey, Larry. Hey, Leo, how are you? I am great. Yes, you are. <laughs> what can I do for you? <laughs> um, I have a question. Actually, I, I thought of another question, but my main question um, is about um, the self-repair um, uh, feature in XP, if it's still in Windows 7. It is. You know how if, if you have an install of Windows, uh, Windows XP and something goes wrong, you can act like you're reinstalling Windows, That's and right. it'll look at the install and say, oh, I see you already have an, an installation. Would you like me to repair it? And you tell it yes, and it replaces some basic Windows files, and I think it repairs the master boot record, and sometimes it fixes your problem and you don't have to reinstall everything. That's exactly well, I tried right. To do this. I tried to do that with 7, and I didn't get offered that option. I was having a problem, so I had to go ahead and just let Windows reinstall itself. Uh, and I wonder the, if there's what a way happens, of doing that. Yeah, I mean, normally what happens is you, uh, you know, th there's a couple of ways to do this. There is a program called System File Checker that you can run that is, I, as far as I know, and maybe somebody will correct me in the chat room, the same thing as the repair function in the uh, install disk. It's not as good because you're running it in an existing, perhaps broken copy of Windows, but it's, it's worth trying. It's SFC, so you, you get to command prompt, or you could do start right. run, and type SFC space slash scan now. You'll still need your Windows install disk because if it finds a damaged system file, it'll say, all right, give me the install disk, and that's where it'll get it from. So that's okay. one way to do it manually. The way to do it, and it's worked for me on 7, unless you have some oddball disk. Is it a full Windows install disk, or is it something that came from the manufacturer? Actually, it, it's a full Windows install disk, but it's an upgrade disk. It should still work. What I've done with 7 in the past is act as if you're going to install Windows. Right. You go through that whole... Pr you, you know what I'm talking about. And right before it installs it, it says, whoa, wait a minute, you have Windows already. Press R to repair. You never saw that. No, I didn't see that because usually at XP it used to say, it didn't say press R, it says, do you want it to repair? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, maybe you just missed it because it's right before the install part and it just, it's kind of not obvious. It says, it gives you a little message, press R to repair, you already have a copy on here. Ah, okay. Yeah. I, su I sus unless you have some oddball install disk, that certainly has worked for me. No, it was a legitimate Windows 7. Yeah. Yeah, that should, even the upgrade disk, you know, the upgrade disk is really the same disk as a full install disk. There's no... Yeah, that's how I always installed Windows. Right. <laughs> you well, know, my friend my Paul Thorat, who does our Windows uh, show and is the, uh, the uh, guy at the blogger at uh, the super site for Windows, says, hey, who isn't upgrading a copy of Windows? Yeah, exactly. I mean, who, for whom is this, could this possibly be the first copy of Windows, you know? So everybody, everybody has it. The, listening to Paul. Yeah, exactly. There is a, a, a Microsoft site, which the chat room just gave me, which I like, called Create a System Repair Disk. And uh, that's kind of neat. You do need a Windows installation disk, or it says access to the recovery options provided by your computer manufacturer. And then it, it has a whole um, process. Well, it's not, actually, it's not a very complicated process, come to think of it. <laughs> Look at this. Click the start button, control panel, system and maintenance. Backup and restore. It's actually in. I didn't know this. Let me go. Let me look at this. Now. See, here's control panel. So it's in the control panel. 
uh, maintenance entry. Um, there is a, uh, let's see, here we go, backup and restore. There is an entry that says create, a, there it is, that's interesting, create a system repair disk. So you can actually do this from within Windows now. That's nice. I mean, that's probably been there for a while, and I'm just not paying attention. So there, this is one of the things I love about Microsoft. They give you 24 ways to do it. And uh, so this Windows backup creates a system image, which is actually a very handy way to restore. Highly, uh, highly recommended. In fact, Lou G, who works for Microsoft, shh, in our chat room, says, uh, that's how I made mine. And he backs up every Sunday night while he's listening. And I love that. It's make, if you make it a habit like that, you know, every night while you're watching the Ed Sullivan show, every Sunday night, you back up. See, that's the kind of thing that you just get in the habit of. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. Oh, that's a different Lou. All right. That's not the Microsoft Lou. Uh, oh, I'm, you know what? I apologize. Sarkis was on the line. Sarkis, I, my deepest apologies. We were talking to you before the break, and I took another call in, in front of you. I'm sorry, Sarkis. Thanks, thanks for your patience. So you said you have a website that you want to demo at a trade show. Correct. And the problem with trade shows, in my experience, of course, I only go to geek trade shows, is that there's a lot of people using the wireless 3G networks, or even if they offer Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi, and so as, so response time is slow. And if you're showing off a website, that's the last thing you want, isn't it? Correct. Yeah, you're going to be in Vegas? Yep. I'm going to be in Vegas. My recommendation, Vegas, Las Vegas has Clear, which is 4G, uh, and Sprint offers that. You could buy a little uh, Sprint 4G modem. That's a USB modem. Plug into your laptop. And the thing is, because Clear is fairly new, um, I, I my experience in Vegas has been not a lot of people are using it. Okay. So you're less likely that what is it a trade show, a technology trade show? No, it's uh, dedicated to the wedding industry. Perfect. And, uh, so there won't be many people using the the the, <laughs> the 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 Clear there. So I would take a look at the Clear 4G. You can rent one. In fact, wow. you probably could rent it in Vegas. And that would work really well for you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I hate to interrupt credence, especially on a day like today. Rainy day on the East Coast, more than rain, wind, and all that stuff, too. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I hope you're surviving. We've got uh, visitors from uh, back east actually in the studio. In fact, Marianne and Bernard, who are visiting from New Jersey, say we may be stuck here for a while. Well, for a while in Northern California. Not so bad. Worst places you could be stuck. Phone number 8888-ASK-LEO. If you've got a question, you want to talk high tech with me, that's what I'm here for. Uh, we talked to Sarkis in Burbank. Let's move now to Neil in Marina del Rey, California, our next caller. Hi, Neil. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. How are you doing? Can you hear me? Great. I hear you great. How about me? Can you hear me? Yeah, very good. Just wanted to make sure my phone was fading it out. Um, I was looking to find out about the new Samsung Epic 4G, the next generation. Do you have any idea when that one's coming out? And also that BlackBerry Torch, that 9850, that new all-touch screen. Any idea? Yeah, the Torch, I think, is close. Um, BlackBerry announced that at their uh, at their BlackBerry Fest a couple of weeks okay. ago. Um, the Epic, I don't, you know, I don't know actually release dates. If they haven't announced them, I'm not, uh, I'm not, it's, it's gotten a little hard to follow all the Android phone releases. My current favorite uh, is the uh, HTC Sensation, I'm, uh, but, I, but I think this, the Epic should be awesome. Um, there are so many great Android phones out there right now, and I am a big fan of the Android operating system. I know it's kind of me. But Samsung, I think, makes really great shows. Now, the Epic is a keyboard phone. And it sounds like because you like that we were interested in the BlackBerry that you perhaps like a physical keyboard. Yeah, because right now I got the BlackBerry Tour. I love the keyboard, but it's just the Internet connectivity is just so damn slow. So I'm thinking about switching to Android. But I saw that new BlackBerry Torch. I got the email intro. I'm like, hmm. Yeah, that might be good. The Epic is on the Sprint network. It supports the 4G we were talking about with Sarkis. Uh, so if you're in a 4G area... Sprint 4G, which you are, I think. Sprint 4G is very good. Um, it's, a, it's one of those Samsungs. I have their, you know, kind of related phone, the Galaxy S, uh, which has the screen is spectacular. 
Uh, it's a nice big four-inch screen. I'm not a fan of physical keyboard phones, so I'm not sure I would recommend it. I have to say the negative on the Epic is that uh, it does not... I find this hard to believe. Can this possibly be true? No, that can't be right. Let me see. I'm, I lost you there. Yeah, no, I'm here. I'm just thinking. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm just thinking. It looks like... Well, I don't know. I want to make sure that it's it's up to the latest, not the quite the latest version of Android, which is Froyo. Um, I want to make sure that they're going to put it uh, put gingerbread on there, which is what you want. Got it. But the, the, has, the Epic hasn't that been out for about a year. There's so the though? old Epic. You're not. Uh, oh, you're talking about the Epic, t the original Epic, or the Epic Two? I guess uh, that's a good question. Um, I just the original it. Epic's been out for a year. You, I th I assumed you meant the Epic Two. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, very similar. Uh, okay. It's not. It's not a dual core, which is I. You know, in other words, it's a little bit behind. Eight megapixel camera. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little bit behind, but uh, but I think that these Samsungs are fantastic, and uh, I I love the Galaxy S. This is essentially a, a, a Galaxy S with a keyboard, and they say Q3, whatever that means. Or a third quarter. Okay. Yeah, I don't. You know, I don't know what it, that that could be. We're in the third quarter, right, aren't we? January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September. It could be as late as September 30th. Got it. Okay. So, yeah, my contract, I'm with Sprint anyway, so I got a couple months ago or a month or so, actually. So. The other, you know, but but it sounds like you want a keyboard, right? Yeah, I'm kind of back and forth. I see my girl, she got that droid charge, and it's just the knob. The screen is absolutely amazing. Yeah. Well, you'll have the best screen. You'll have because you'll have that super AMOLED screen that Samsung does. Uh, it's a little of a disappointing phone in the sense that it's, it's not dual core, which is kind of the standard now, and um, it's only a four inch screen. But you, but the, but the thing is, a slider, a keyboard. Generally, I think they assume the people who use slider keyboards aren't so worried about that, that they want the keyboard. Right. So, uh, according to a rumor. July, but I guess that rumor is not true. <laughs> I'm looking. I'm looking at this is my next.com, which is a a great site for people who are into gadgets. Peter Rojas, and uh, um, is it Peter Rojas who does that site? No, it's Joshua Topolsky, uh, ex of Engadget, does that site, and it's a great site. But uh, I guess they missed on that missed on that rumor. That's the problem. Is that until the phone you know really ships, it's very it's always a guessing game. I think what happens a lot with these phones now is that the components are in short supply or they have trouble uh, getting the software updates or maybe they're waiting for uh, Google to update. And for some reason, that just the Android phones, it's very hard to predict when they're going to be out. I'm looking at a June article that says Sprint's Q3 roadmap leaked. Yeah. Samsung, let's see what they say. Now, this came out in June. Let's see what they say. Samsung Epic 2 will be out mm, first of all successor next oh, it doesn't say exactly when yeah that's the problem this is all from this is my next so uh, q3 roadmap it's, i don't know you know what my answer should have been is this i stand by my answer i don't know if you want a keyboard phone, they're getting harder and harder to get because more and more people are starting to use phones with soft keyboards, on-screen keyboards like the iPhone. And, I, you know, I'd give it a try because I, I think a lot of people who think they can't use it end up saying, oh, this isn't so bad. Boy Genius Report says early September for the Galaxy S2. But that's not the same as the Epic Tour, is it? Well, Q3. That's all we know. Lee... In New Jersey. Hope you're batting down the hatches, Lee. Ha! Ah, it's me. Hey, it's you, Lee. My God, I can't believe it. I, as as one movie star would say uh, in uh, one of the one of the past uh, old movies, uh, I'm not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not worthy. We're not worthy. I'm not worthy of this, Leo. <laughs> oh, come on. Well, I want to congratulate you on excellent show. Thank both you. Past and present. Thank uh, you. Great studio. It looks excellent. Thank you. Uh, and I'm enjoying the heck out of all your shows as much as I can consume, uh, human, humanly possible anyway. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, I, I have my own little amateur podcast show that I talk about. Well, I actually rant more than I talk. I love rants. What's the name of the show? 
Uh, it's uh, it's called Tech Rant. It's from uh, my website vrpcrworld.org, uh, and I try to cover a lot of topics. Unfortunately, I sometimes come off of the uh, the main topic of technology, uh, but uh, I try to keep it within reason. <laughs> when you once you start ranting, once you start ranting, it's hard to stop. It is hard to stop. It's like a, it's like an addiction, and I kind of it feels good to watch your show and see you guys so mildly talk about uh, issues that are uh, affecting everyone in the industry and the uh, consumers and everyone else. So it's kind of like your your show is more of a pacifying effect to me. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Very good show. We calm you down. Uh, first of all, I wanted to uh, like I said, I, I congratulate you on your show. It's an excellent Thank you. show. Hang on, Lee. The congratulations can continue. Right after okay. this word from our sponsors. Hang on. All right. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <laughs> like that. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. My phone number is 8888-ASK-LEO. My uh, website is techguylabs.com. And uh, before we broke, uh, we were talking to, is it Lee or Leo? It looks like on the webpage it's Leo in New Jersey. Lee. Yes. I'm yeah. back? Yes. Is it Lee uh, or Leo? Uh, uh, yeah. I w well, I'll, I'll get straight to the question that I have. I, I was going to say, well, uh, mention that uh, I enjoy your co-host as well on one of the, your other shows, uh, Dick DiBartoli. Oh, well, he's coming and up. I'm Dick Gargadget. And i uh, live uh, come up uh, this coming weekend, the third, I believe. Oh, good. As well. Great. And just sit on the corner like a little fly and watch everything that uh, people do. Good. And Lee. learn. Good. Um. I wanted to ask you a serious question about technology. With all the stuff that's going on right now in the news, uh, where the they're claiming that the desktop is dead or dying, uh, everyone abandoning ship, late, latest casualty being HP, do you really think that the tablets or the portable technology is killing the desktop? Yeah, or well, it's killing sales. I think that uh, Steve Jobs said it best. He He was... Uh, on a panel uh, about a year ago, uh, All Things Digital uh, does a conference called the D Conference, and he spoke at the D Conference, and he talked about this issue. Is the PC dead? He said the PC, the personal computer, laptop or desktop, is a truck. He says, if you liken it to the auto industry, you still need trucks for the heavy lifting. You need a personal computer, for instance, to develop software for a tablet. You, you, you know, you can't develop software for a tablet on a tablet. So developers are going to still need personal computers. I think personal computers are not going away. It's funny, I asked many years ago, I asked Paul Odellini, who was the at the time the chairman of Intel, um, if the PC was dead. It shows how premature I was. This was, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. I said, I don't, and this was before tablets really were taken off, but it just felt to me like there were these devices coming along, like smartphones and tablets, that would replace the desktop computer. He said the PC will survive as a hub. I think he was saying the same thing as Steve Jobs is saying, that the PC itself is, is, the, it is still necessary for the heavy lifting. But more and more of computing is going to occur on Portable devices, mobile. I think we often think of new technologies as supplanting old technologies, replacing them. I don't know why, but it's just kind of, it must be a human nature. When TV came along, that's it for the radio. When radio came along, that's it for the newspaper. Well, we still have all three. So the tablet, yes, the tablet's going to be huge. It's going to be a huge category. It's going to bring computing to more people. Some people might replace their computer with a tablet or not buy a computer. That's, that's true. PC sales are not down. They're not down. Um, there have been blips where perhaps people go into Best Buy and they buy a tablet instead of a PC. Look, we all have limited budgets. You can't spend 500 bucks on a tablet and then another 500 bucks on a PC. So people are going to maybe purchase fewer PCs or spread their, their purchases out. However... I think we still need them. And I think uh, certainly people who are doing video editing, photographers, people who create content, writers, are going to end up getting something with a keyboard and a big screen. It's not going away. Remember we all thought we'd have a paperless office by now? 
I think the actual facts are there's more paper than ever before, not less. New technologies don't usually replace the old. Um, which is not to say that tablets and smartphones aren't taking over the world. In fact, more and more uh, of uh, companies that watch how people surf, how people get online, the, the, the amount of uh, mobile traffic coming to websites now is skyrocketing. More and more, that's how people are getting online. 8888 asked, Leo, I'm still going to use a truck. I'm a truck driver. I'm going to continue to use a truck. Lee, thanks for the call. I appreciate it. George in Houston, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi there. Before I ask my question, I'm wondering, do you still stream this show live on the uh, Tech Guy video networks? The network is Twit, which is my podcast network, This Week in Tech, and you can watch this and all the shows I do live uh, at live.twit.tv. So, George, you're on right now. Wow, I was looking at it right but now. But listen to your local station. <laughs> I, don't wanna, I don't want anybody to think this replaces the radio version of this show. Yeah. Uh, we, we also make a podcast version available. But if you want to see the video, and, you know, I think it's nice to once in a while tune in to, to see the beautiful new studio we've built. But uh, really, frankly, it's a talking head show. The easiest way to do it is to listen on the radio. Hmm. Wow. Um, the cable company Comcast sent me a router. Aren't they I nice? I Yes, I installed it. I uh, would start routers before, but I'm having a problem with this router that's really, really perplexing me and people have asked about this uh, and have no idea. I see people having the same issue on the internet because they have been complaining about this. That if I use the router, I cannot get it to connect to my laptop if I use WEP or WEP, I'm sorry, WPA or WPA2 encryption. It works fine if I just use WEP encryption or no encryption at all. And um, I've made I'll made sure everything's up to date in my computer. How old is the laptop? About three years. Yeah, so it supports WPA. I mean, it says WPA in the settings, right? Yes, and I've used WPA before with, with, with another okay, router. Okay, so we know the we know that the the laptop itself. What we're talking about, by the way, folks, is is wireless encryption, which is very very important. So any any wireless router you use, is certainly in your home, should have WPA2, I recommend, WPA2 turned on. What that means is that anybody who wants to get on your network has to know the password. They have to log in. Uh, it keeps the packets that are flying through the air from that router encrypted so no one can kind of watch what you're doing. So it, it, it's, it's really important. In fact, it's the only security I think you need on a wireless network. The older version, WEP, is not as good. It's It's been broken. So you're... Right to be concerned, George. You don't want to use WEP, even though it will work. Uh, I'm very puzzled as to why. Um, I've I've Googled this, and it seems the people are having trouble with this. The actual router itself is the uh, Netgear um, WNR 1000V2-VC, and I've seen lots of people complaining about. It. I even got through the Netgear, and Netgear saying they're claiming it's the receiver in my computer. But I'm saying if that's the case, why does it work fine with another router? And So can other computers get on WPA on this router? I've not tried another computer, but I've tried uh, other routers with my computer. And yeah, but I would see if you can try another device. Maybe the WPA isn't working on that Comcast. And I was going to say, I've used, uh, I got connected to, with my Roku box. It works fine with that. Using WPA? Yes. Okay. So we know WPA is that the router is doing the uh, WPA presumably properly. Uh, you, have you tried different flavors of WPA? There's WPA Personal, WPA Enterprise. You use Personal. Enterprise looks kind of complicated to set up. I never tried that. Hmm. Um, you know, just the, I've, I've always have used WPA um, Personal. And it seems to have always worked with, the, with another router. I even brought a router from a friend of mine to see if it would work, and it worked fine. It's just something. Chatroom has a bunch of suggestions. I'm going to just feed a few of them to you, George. I'm not going to ask you whether you tried them or not, but these are things that you might want to try. One is, of course, changing the frequency. Some routers do 2.4 gigahertz and 5. Try one or the other. See if they're both broken. Um, try N as well as G. Sometimes you could tell the router, don't even bother with G, just do N. Uh, sometimes it could be that the SSID is confusing Windows. You might try changing the SSID. 
Make sure that you are using personal on both ends. They have to be compatible. I'll try a few of those. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. WPA does not take three seconds to hack a ham 73. However, if you use a dumb password, brute force attacks can crack Eight it. Times are but tough, WPA is actually secure for today. Keep the skill out of it. If it wasn't for us, That's true. We got to have some trucks. Look at him sipping coffee and flirting that way. Doing some heavy lifting. Where do you think he will be? I love it. I love it. Yeah, I, I hope computers don't go away. You know, I have to say, in my career, um, when we when I I've been doing this kind of thing, tech talk, on radio since 1991, 20 years, and uh, it was really a computer talk show for the first probably 10, 15. It wasn't really only to to maybe four or five years ago that smartphones started coming out, and and really computing. Stop being just computers. It started being your phone. It started being tablets. It really did start to change. And even home theater and all this stuff. It's all te high tech. It's all technology. And I went kicking and screaming. I said, I'm not a gadget guy. Don't talk. Don't think of me as a gadget guy. I'm a computer. I'm a serious technologist. I don't have to be honest with you. I mean, all of the advances, everything that's exciting that's happening right now is happening in the mobile space. There hasn't been a lot of exciting stuff to talk about in computing for some time. This is computing. These little things, these are computers. So it's an artificial distinction anyway. Whether it has a keyboard or not, big deal. Mark Norwalk, California, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Mark. How you doing, Leo? Wonderful. How are you? Uh, pretty good. Um... Well, speaking of trucks, uh, I think I built a bulldozer. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> um, I'm uh, I'm only limited by my internet connection, which that was my question. Uh, I wanted to know, like, what would be the fastest uh, internet connection available because uh, that's the only thing I'm limited by. So you got like a state of the art i7 processor in there, and how much RAM? Uh, uh, a hexacore with uh, 12 gigs of DDR5 at 2 gigahertz. <laughs> you must be a gamer, right? Uh, a little bit. Yeah, what video card? Uh, a Radeon 4870 HDX2. Wow, how much did you spend on this thing? A lot. You don't even want to know, do you? You've never even added it um, up. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, I, I have, but it's been a while. I You got a I truck. This thing... I built this thing about uh, three years ago, but I've upgraded a few things here. You've got there. a bulldozer. Well, that's one of the nice things about doing that is that you can upgrade as you go. So um, now here's the thing. Uh, there isn't an answer to the what is the fastest Internet uh, question because it's very dependent on where you are and also how much you want to spend. You can always get faster Internet. I'll give you an example. Here in our new studios... We, uh, because we do a lot of streaming and we do a lot of uploading, and internet is really what we do. We're an internet. I'm an internet broadcaster, so having a good, high-speed, reliable connection is worth it. So currently, we have a connection from uh, a local internet service provider called SonicNet. They do because the phone company's two blocks from here. It's very close by. We can get copper phone line in here. And put a high-speed connection on it called Ethernet to the First Mile, or EFM. I would guess it's an ADSL type, but I don't know. And it gives us, we're getting 35 megabits back and forth. By the way, that's called symmetric. Most Internet connections are asymmetric. Much faster download speed than upload speed. You might look on your on you know, your uh, contract or whatever, see what your internet service provider promised you. Usually, the download speed will be, you know, 4, 5, 6, 7, 10, 20 megabits, million bits per second. The upload speed will be 768 kilobits, maybe 1 megabit or 1.5 megabits per second. It'll be a tenth of what your download speed is. And that's a little bit of an old-fashioned way of thinking. Because it used to be most people did more, a lot more, you know, surfing and email. They were, the, the incoming stuff had to be faster than the outgoing stuff. But nowadays, we, you know, you make a podcast, you make video, you're uploading photos, uh, you're uploading video. You, you may be using a lot of upstream. 
So for us, for instance, because we are a content creator, upstream is even more important than our downstream. That's why we get a symmetric 35 megabits. Now that's costing us 1300 bucks a month. We're going to Comcast and getting fiber from them for 2300 bucks a month, another $1,000 a month, and getting 100 megabits symmetric. Now, I know there are listeners in Sweden, for instance, listening right now who are mocking me because in Sweden you can get 100 megabits symmetric for around $25 a month. U.S. speeds are much slower than the rest of the world, and I'm not sure why. You could ascribe it to greed. I don't know. The other thing you got to consider is caps. You can have a very fast connection, but if they limit you to 50 or 250 gigabytes a month, you could burn through that in a week with a really fast connection. So what you want is uncapped high-speed internet for the lowest price you can get. And the truth is it's not tied to the technology. Generally speaking, cable is faster than DSL. Certainly more capability. It's a, it's a bigger pipe. But DSL is limited by how close you are to the central office. The closer you are, the faster that pipe can be. And there are providers now providing ADSL2, for instance, which can bond two phone lines and give you 20 megabits. So it just, it really, there is no right answer. You need to, you need to ask your neighbors, your friends, maybe visit broadbandreports.com and see what the reviews are for your area. You got to say, well, what, what, you know, what's the best in this area? If all other things being equal, the fastest is cable, then DSL, then 4G. But there's considerable variation among them. And there are kind of specialty flavors like this EFM. Ellie in Honolulu. Ellie, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, and I'm so glad to talk to you again. And I'm glad that you don't have a club that I have to join to get perks and all that <laughs> stuff. Some hosts but, do, don't they? Yes, they do. And we won't mention any names. I'm just not good at monetizing. That's called monetizing, by the way. Okay. Give well, me money! That's monetizing. Yeah, exactly. Well, I could use that, but, you know, who can? Actually, I shouldn't say that because, you know, when we built the studio... One of the ways we raised money, I'm not a nonprofit, but it was a, we're talking a million dollar studio, is we sold bricks in the entry lobby. We've got this great wall of honor with all the bricks. We sold almost 2,000 bricks. So maybe, maybe, maybe I am good at monetizing. Of course, completely voluntary. You don't have to join a club to listen or. Call. Right, but that, that's what I don't like about that whole system. I like voluntary. Right. If you feel like it, fine. If you're on you know, limited income, as I know you are, you don't have to yeah. worry about it. If I would have had the money, I would have bought a brick. Honey, no, you don't have to buy a brick. Exist. It's okay. Nobody has to buy a brick. No, but I would have liked to have bought one. Well, I really it's, would have. It's nice. My wife said the same thing. She said, where's our brick? I said, honey, this is a fundraiser. She <laughs> said, where's our brick? So I bought her a brick. <laughs> anyway, I thought I was losing my mind, so that's why I'm asking you this question. I downloaded an app on the iPad, and then later on I went to the iPhone, and that app was on the phone. I said, I didn't put it there. How did it get there? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there's a checkbox in iTunes that is right there in the settings for the iPhone that says automatically add new applications. So when, when did you, this happen? Uh, I don't know. It might, you know, they keep updating I, iTunes. I don't know. It might, might have been fairly recently, but it is a, definitely a setting. I uncheck it because I frequently put apps on my iPad I don't want on my phone. Exactly. Uh, so that's all it is. Uh, just when you plug it, next time you plug in your phone, go to the settings, and in, in the apps tab, you'll see a checkbox. It just says automatically add new apps to your phone. The funny thing is you can install that app on your iPad. The iPad will automatically sync it to your desktop, and then your desktop will automatically sync it to your iPhone. So you might want to uncheck that box. Leo, nice to talk to you, Ali. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today, Leo Laporte, the tech guy? And it's time to talk computers, the internet, cell phones, camcorders, MP3 players, home theater, all that jazz. Our gizwiz, Dick D. Bartolo, Mad Magazine's maddest writer, joins us at 47 after the hour today. But until then, I'm answering your questions. 888-827-5536. That's a toll-free number anywhere in the U.S. If you're outside the U.S., Skype out. Or any VoIP product should be toll-free as well. Plus one, 888.
800-827-5536. 888-ASK-LEO. Carrie in Cleveland, Ohio, you're next. Hi, Carrie. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo, how are you? Fantastic. How are you? I'm wonderful. Well, I'm, I'm even better now that you have converted me from a Windows 7 guy to a iMac guy. Ah, you like it. Now, you, you oh, have to point I'm, out that one of the things I'm doing right now on my iMac, which is right in front of me, is I've got Windows on it, I've got Mac on it, and then one of the advantages Apple offers is uh, you can run Windows on a Mac. Yeah, I did that. I, it lasted two days, and I uninstalled it. <laughs> you may never use it, <laughs> but if, exactly. it's, I'll tell you where I, it's I useful. Able... If there are Windows programs you have that you need to use, then right. you can do it. I, well, that, and that's kind of a question that I have for you, uh, whether or not you or your viewers or listeners um, may know of something in the Mac platform that would be a good basic invoicing program. I do a oh. lot of freelance video work, and I have to do in monthly invoicing to uh, the local regional sports networks or whoever I'm working for for that, for that month. Do you uh, uh, use an accounting program? I, I do not. Well, I use QuickBooks for my own personal stuff, but I don't, I mean, I'm Quicken uh, for the Mac platform, yeah. but I don't need the, something as intensive as like a QuickBooks. I just need to do a simple invoice and you know what I recommend? In fact, I used, I don't invoice anymore because I have people who do that for me, so I don't yeah. have to worry about that. But when I was uh, by myself as a freelancer, uh, I used FreshBooks all the time. Now, it's not a program. It's a website. But okay. it, but it, you don't really, and in some ways, I think this is better than having a dedicated program to do it. It's a website that lets you upload your logo, custom uh, invoices. Um, if you do time and hours, it does the tracking on, a, on an iPhone or a little website website. Uh, uh, doohickey. Um, it will mail invoices as well, you know, print invoices and mail them as well as uh, invoice over the email. The nice thing about the email is you can have a button on the email that says uh, pay, you know, pay carry right now. And your your client can just use a credit card or PayPal or one of the authorized.net and pay you, oh, wow. which is uh, a really clever thing and uh, i just i loved this it, it, it system it's gotten better over the years it's uh, and here's the best part it's free for the uh for th up to three clients oh okay uh and then it's not very expensive if you want to add more so it's certainly easy to to, to try it to start out right. and try it right i think i will do that i appreciate the suggestion yeah i'm a big fan this is there are a couple of other invoicing online invoicing services like this the nice thing about online is it's not you could invoice them anywhere in fact you, you know they have an app you can invoice them from your phone Right. Well, that's that's one of the things I noticed on the uh, the app store was you know there's a couple free ones but they're very very basic, and then some of the ones that are pays you obviously you don't want to be buying twenty and thirty dollar programs just to try them out. Right. I would say try FreshBooks and I think you'll find it's exactly what you want. Sounds like a great suggestion. Yeah. I appreciate. Hey, thanks for the call. Oh, I should I should mention, I got to do this as disclaimer. They uh, they don't advertise on this show, but they do advertise on some of our podcasts. So I do have a financial relationship with FreshBooks. They're an advertiser. I should always say that, shouldn't I? Happens that I used them for years, uh, starting in 2004, long before they were an advertiser. Um, getharvest.com, Slayer Dork's telling me in the chat room, is another one that's online with a free trial. Getharvest.com. Not familiar with them. Let me take a look. Uh, easy, time track, send invoices, run your business. That's cool. A lot of big businesses use this one. This looks pretty cool. So there's many choices. And, of course, the reason I asked him if he uses, say, QuickBooks is most accounting programs will, of course, do invoicing. That's kind of built into accounting programs. Uh, that's, that's pretty much automatic. Um, Janet, Southern California, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Janet. Hello there. You don't sound like Janet. No, I'm not. Well, uh, who, who uh, did I push the wrong button? Who? Wait a minute, I did. Hold on. I'm going to get the call screen to talk to you because uh, I don't want to put somebody on the air without talking to uh, Gina first. Now I got Janet in Southern California. Hi, Janet. Hi, Leo. Thanks for taking my call. I pushed the wrong button. I apologize. You're welcome. Thanks for calling. No problem. I do a lot of swimming, and I like to listen to my iPod. What do you suggest as far as headphones? The there, waterproof there are waterproof headphones, and uh, Dick D. Bartolo... Our Gizwiz uh, recommended a pair. I I have used them not underwater, so I don't <laughs> I don't know how they work. Let me see if I can find the name because it's been a while. Um, which ones did he recommend? Was it the Surge? I think it might have been the Surge. I'm Radio seeing. Audio. 
Yeah, there's it's H two O audio. I think this is the one that he tried. Uh, there are a couple of them. There's also, um, but, you know, at forty nine bucks, it's probably worth a try. And if if it failed, well, you you know, it's not the end of the world. Any headphone is ultimately going to be a little vulnerable to water where they where they go in your ear. You know, they, yeah, yeah. You know, but uh, but I guess these these look like they're pretty well uh, sealed against the uh, elements. Um, so there's H two O O audio, twenty seven bucks. That's not bad at all. Okay, that's not bad on Amazon.com. And I'm trying to remember the ones he recommended. He's gonna be on in half an hour. I'll ask him. Um, okay. I'll keep listening. Yeah, because I can't remember, but I think it was. For some reason, I think it was the Surge. Uh, Best Buy has them for fifty bucks, but there's a these H two O's are on the uh, on the uh, Amazon page for twenty seven bucks. That's a pretty good, pretty good price. So yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Janet. I think that's a neat idea. They, they need a waterproof iPod. <laughs> uh, that's. I did. She should have asked me about that. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. Make sure you have a, a waterproof container for uh, your player. That's even more important. Don't they sometimes pipe? I know I've been places where they pipe audio into the pool. When your head's underwater, you hear. I mean, it's not perfect. Dennis in Orange County, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Dennis. Hi, Leo. Hey, uh, what a pleasure to speak to you. I, I, you make me sound like a genius when I when I talk to people, and I've listened to you for you for years and years. You go to my car, you go out to the Thank pool you. with me. Aren't you uh, great? Thank you. All over the house and. Uh, and, and I appreciate it. And Dennis, I give you license. I give everybody license. You don't have to say Leo says. You could you could just say I say. Say don't you don't have to say Dennis says. <laughs> well, I do tell people. I, I give them the uh, the KFI. You know, you're on Thank the you. radio. Thank you. Thank you. Time to listen to you. Yeah. At any rate, uh, I, I'm, I'm, it's such a pleasure to talk to you after listening to you for so many years, and and uh, I look forward to your advice here. All right. My problem is a TiVo, Time Warner cable, and an adapter box. All right. An unholy alliance between TiVo, Time Warner cable, and an adapter box. Yes. Uh, Time Warner has me using this adapter box now. It's a Cisco adapter box. And the long story uh, short is the months of troubleshooting uh, and the finger now points to the adapter box, yeah. and Time Warner says the, uh, that's it. That's the only adapter box uh, we have, and TiVo says... Uh, so the problem is that you want to use the best DVR, which is TiVo. Time Warner doesn't offer it, so you need to somehow interface the TiVo with your cable box. And well, and so yeah. the case, because what happens is you program the TiVo to change to channel 26 at 4 p.m. to record the tennis match. The problem is, how do you tell the cable box? So you have to have this adapter that goes from the one to the other. Hold on, and I want to find out some more details. And maybe our chat room has some experience, too, because they're pretty good in this kind of thing. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <laughs> I think this song is for Manhattan, isn't it? Which will may soon be under the sea. You are evil, Kyle Benham. Kyle Benham on the controls today, playing the music. Blame him. Don't forget the underwater uh, headphones. It's also for the underwater headphones, he says. Yeah, right. And uh, Gina, who is it, Gina Yates on the phones today? You got it. Hey, Gina. So it's good to have you both running the show, and I'm just here making a fool of myself. 8888 Ask Leo. I'm Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Now we, sometimes we get visitors. It's kind of nice in our studio. And uh, we have a, a, a mother and son in here. In fact, I talked to you. Come on, on, come on up to the microphone. Pull that microphone up to your face there. Just that microphone there, yeah. You don't have to worry about the cameras. Just worry about the microphone. <laughs> he's, getting on, he's getting on camera. What's your name? Steven. Hi, Steven. How are you? Good. Welcome to the show. So you, we talked to you a couple of weeks ago about a mixer, right, for your podcast? Yeah. So you've ordered that, but you, you haven't had a chance to play with it yet. So what's your next um, question? What's your new well, question? So, for the mixer, um... How old are you? Twelve. So, you're sixth grade? Seventh. Seventh, great. And so, 
I went on Amazon and the reviews said, well, it's a five channel mixer, mm -hmm. but it only has one XLR input. Oh, that's too bad. And they're like two or three. You need one that quarter, has quarter inch. Yeah, you can use quarter inch instead of XLR for a microphone. That's fine. So, it's that's better to have XLR, but that's fine. My quarter inch will be fine. So you'll get a special. You'll get a cable that has a XLR adapter for the microphone, and then a quarter inch on the other side of that. That'll work. And uh, do you have? Uh, do you know anything about any green screening software that? <laughs> uh, that I so you want to do a video? Is this going to be a video podcast as well? Yeah. So you want to have kind of a newsroom set behind you. Yeah, there's an anchor ah. desk and then to the side, green screen. He's going to do a show called This Week in News, right? Mm -hmm. And you're going to have the Civil War Battle of the Week and the World War II Battle of the Week? Mm -hmm. Wow. Is this your friends in school that are doing this with yeah. you? Yeah. Wow, that's so cool. That's so cool. Um yeah, there's a, um, almost any video software that does that kind of video editing will do green screening. Um, VidBlaster will. Uh, Wirecast will. Um, problem is they're expensive. They're a few hundred dollars, and you probably have yeah. a limited amount of money. Uh, you know what? I'm going to take you next door. Actually, you're doing it after the fact, or are you going to do it the green screen live or after the fact? After. Afterwards, you'll edit it? Yeah. Ah, then that's a little bit easier. Even programs like Premiere will do it. Uh, Pinnacle Studio will do it. So those editing programs have that capability. The key is, and I'm going to take you next door, the key is in having a perfect green backdrop that's lit just right so there's no shadows. Uh, and, and that's more important even than the software because even if the software isn't super great, um, the, 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 if it's a good green behind you, it's easy. We, we call that keying it out. You have a key color, in this case, usually green, and you replace whatever's green with, say, a newsroom set. You know why you use green? What would happen if you used, say, blue? Uh, if you were wearing blue. It would go right through you. Exactly. So we use a color that isn't normally too often seen in life. They used to use blue screens. The problem is you'd have weather guys with, <laughs> with blue shirts. It wouldn't work too well. So now we, uh, now we use green, and we use such a bright, hideous color of green that it doesn't usually occur in nature. Do you like, should I get Premiere Elements or Premiere Pro? Elements is all you need. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a good start. It's less than 100 bucks. Mom's happy about that. It's about 79 bucks if you shop around. And last question. Um, how do you, well, what program do you use or how do you design the lower thirds for your... Well, music? that's, yeah. So we're using something called a TriCaster, which is a very expensive, oh. fancy switcher. That's what does all the lower thirds for us. Um, if you wanted to do lower thirds in something like Premiere, it'd be pretty easy to do. You just create them and kind of apply them uh, on top of it. Um, there's probably a plug-in for Premiere that would do that. Let me, let me look around and see. Because um, what you want is something with an alpha channel. So what that means is that it's a graphic that's transparent. You know, like transparent GIFs or there's a, tr there's a transparent part and then there's a non-transparent part. That's the, that's the, the, the name of the person or, or, the, mm -hmm. or the logo of the show. That part's not transparent, but everything else has to be. And then you overlay that on top of the video. That way the video comes through. And then the lower third, which... You know, you see on most TV shows that that's called a lower third, even though it's more like a lower eighth. That uh, that doesn't shine through. So I'll help you with that. We'll figure out. There must be something out there. Good. Good luck, though. And let us know when this week in news, twin. I like that goes on the air. Nice okay. to meet you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dennis, Orange, California. You're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Dennis. Hi, Leo. So you, oh yeah, we were talking about you, Time Warner, and the mystery adapter box. Right. So when you say it doesn't work, how it does not work doesn't, how does that, what does that mean, it doesn't work? Right, that, exactly. What, it, what happens is it drops channels, and it's all over the map. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not there. So, and it usually happens when I'm recording, obviously, because I, I know when I go to watch the recorded uh, channel that it, it doesn't show up. It never recorded. And, and, and I've had the, uh, the Time Warner technician come into my home and, and be on the phone with the TiVo technician in troubleshooting this. Is it, is it a, a cable that goes into the back of the TiVo and comes out of the cable box? 
Yeah, it goes into the, yeah, it goes yeah. into. Because there's, a, you know, the old-fashioned way of doing this is with something called an IR blaster that actually <laughs> fools the TiVo into thinking it's a remote control or fools the cable box into thinking it's a remote control. Yeah. This is a better way to do it. Um, Bawit the Baba in our chat room says that this is, it asks if this is a Cisco STA1520 tuning adapter. He um, says those are can be kind of flaky. He says if the light isn't solid green, it needs to be replaced. Solid green. It is an ST, it, that's, that is the model number, and it is solid green. And I've actually gone through a couple of these adapter boxes. Um, because Time Warner's been very cooperative, and so is TiVo. They even sent me a new uh, TiVo box, uh, an, an upgrade, even, in, in, in trying to, to resolve this. Uh, but th th right now, the bottom line is they're pointing the finger at, this, th at the Cisco adapter box, which is apparently not allowing the, uh, a consistent signal for the channels to come through. And they did a hot wire, you know, uh, right from the, uh, the adapter box, which it goes from, the cable goes directly to the adapter box and then into the TiVo. Yeah, so. yeah, no, I understand. It's, um, you know, <sighs> it's, it's not ideal, obviously. Um, and this is the problem. And, of course, you don't want to use Time Warner's DVR because it's not anywhere as good as a TiVo. But, frankly, this is why most people end up using, including me, the DVR that comes from the cable company. Because it's just so difficult, alas, for um, the, the TiVo to... It's, a, it's, it's what you might call an impedance mismatch for the TiVo to work with the cable box. You've got to get the TiVo, as I mentioned earlier, to control the cable box. This adapter is notoriously flaky. I've got no good solution for you. If Time Warner couldn't fix it, I can't. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I don't know if it's evil or not. You tell me. Google under investigation by the U.S. Department of Justice and several states' attorneys general for putting, allowing ads on Google, you know, the Google AdSense, you know, those ads that you see on pages everywhere, for Canadian pharmacies aimed at the U.S. selling drugs to the U.S. Justice Department investigators believe that Larry Page, Google founder and CEO, knew about the ads and allowed them for years. It's hard for me to get all head up about this. It, you got to think it's the it's the U.S. Pharma pharmaceutical companies that are upset, isn't it? Why do people buy drugs from Canadian pharmacies? Because they're the same drugs for a lot less money. That's why. That's why people drive to Canada to get their cancer medications. So who's who's hurt by this big pharma that charges different amounts of money in different countries depending on what they can get away with? Now, it is admittedly true that some of these, quote, Canadian pharmacies are not. Some of the drugs they sell are not actually high-quality drugs. Some of them may even be dangerous. It's illegal for foreign pharmacies to ship prescription drugs to customers in the U.S. Google did admit on Wednesday that they did improperly allow Canadian pharmacies to run ads targeting U.S. consumers... They are going to pay a fine of half a billion dollars. And uh, this plea, I guess you call it a plea or agreement, doesn't mention top executives of Google. Google says, we've settled, we're moving on. Peter Neronia, the Rhode Island U.S. attorney who led the probe, says, we know from the investigation Larry Page knew what was going on. I'm sorry, I just can't get too uh, head up about that, to be honest with you. I really can't. Lance in Springfield, Massachusetts. Hey, Lance, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. I, I have a review and a joke and a question. First, I'll give you the review. You had suggested to me maybe four to six weeks ago I was looking for a headset uh, for uh, Bluetooth, and you had suggested the B250 XT Blue Parrot, and I couldn't be more pleased. This is you're 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 a trucker, right? So it was a very noisy environment. 
Right, right. And the Blue Parrot, it's handling that noise cancellation well. Well, what do you think? I'm talking to you on it now. Are you driving? Oh, yeah. We're going 65 here there, brother. Oh, it works great. I can't believe it. Yeah, that's what I say. Not only that, but the charging, I mean, I've only charged it maybe two times in a month. I don't use it, uh, you know, a lot, but still it holds charge forever. I mean, I'm coming from a, a jawbone, too, and I'd have to charge that frequently. And to tell you the truth, I could never get on your program with the jawbone. Because wow. It, it, didn't cut it, but this this does an amazing job. Well, this one has a boom mic that goes right next to your mouth, and that's one of the reasons. You know, the the jawbone, the microphone's way back by your ear, and I have to say, I've never been comfortable with that design. You know, I always feel like, well, how can it hear what I'm saying? And, and what's that now? <laughs> you can hear me, I hope. <laughs> I just think this is a better design because the boom's next to your mouth. Of course, it has a lot of noise canceling. I don't hear any noise from the cab, and that's pretty amazing. Yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah. I'm very pleased. Plus, I got it off of Amazon, so I saved, you know, maybe 25 to $50 from the uh, retail spots on the, uh, you know, truck stop. So right. I was happy about that, too. But I wanted to uh, ask you, what is, the, uh, what is the similarity between the present administration and the Apple Corporation? I don't know what. No jobs. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's very timely. I like it, Lance. Did you make that up, or did you hear it somewhere? No, I heard it, but I was hoping that you would. <laughs> I had not heard that. I like it a lot. <laughs> no jobs. So you can use it later. You can I use will. It. I'll use it Sunday on Twit, on This Week in Tech. I'll say, uh, no jobs. <laughs> What's the similarity between the economy and Apple Computer? <laughs> well, you okay. said, okay, so you said a review, a joke, and then? And a question. A question. I mean, laptop has uh and my c drive it has uh you know 66 gigs available but i mean only four gigs of free space left and i don't have hardly any data music or uh, or pictures it's remarkable it. how hard drives could fill up those are the things that fill it up though you're saying you filled up 62 gigs right and you can't I, figure out what's on there right i can't see it because i have virtually no data left. I mean, I've wiped everything off. I've gone through disc, disc cleaner and disc defragment, and it still doesn't make an appreciable difference. And I don't know where to look to find what I could sweep out. There, First of all, it's not a very big drive, but it shouldn't, if you don't have a lot of heavy media on there, that should be enough. There's a program that's free, that's great, that will give you a visual look at what's on your hard drive. So you can kind of see where the big files are. Because it could be a cache file. It could be uh, temp files are taking up a lot of space. So this is, it's a Windows machine, I presume. What's the program? It's a window. You're saying you're on a Windows machine. Yeah, a well, Vista. Okay. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to, don't write this down. You're driving. <laughs> but I'll put it in the show notes. James will at techguylabs.com. It's called Windurstat. We've recommended it before, W-I-N-D-I-R-S-T-A-T. And what it gives you, which is great, is this, is this big blob, color blobs for everything that's on there. It's a tree, it's a map of your hard drive and how uh, different types of files consume space. And so this is, you know, you could, of course, do a search. In fact, it's really easy to do a find and the, in the advanced features of the find in Windows, say, I want to find any file that's bigger than, say, a gigabyte. That might be a good idea. Just see if there's some giant file on there you forgot about. Don't, if it's the cache, the page file, pagefile.sys, don't delete that. You can, you can make it smaller in the, in, the, in the settings for Windows, but don't, <laughs> don't delete that. Uh, be careful with that. But Windurstat, W-I-N-D-I-R-S-T-A-T, is great. On the Mac, Web9476 is right. He's suggesting something called Grand Perspective. It's exactly the same thing. It uh, gives you a colored blob for every different file type. It's a great way to figure out what's on your system. So I'd recommend either. And and uh, thanks, Lance, for the review. It's, I love getting the you know the feedback after the fact to make sure... And I can't take credit for this pick. This was out of the chat room. Uh, truckers, headset, or headset for anywhere where there's a lot of noise and you want good noise cancellation. It's the Blue Parrot from VXI 
model number is B250 XT. And one of the reasons it's got good battery life is it's big. There's lots of room for a battery. One of the reasons it sounds good is there's a boom mic that goes right next to your mouth. But they do have active noise canceling in it, too. Kind of like in your boy, Bose Quiet Comfort uh, headphones. And that makes a big difference, too. The Blue Parrot 250 XT. And I'm glad that worked uh, for you. Nice, nice to know. We can once in a while come up with a good recommendation. Dick T. Bartolo, the Gizwiz Mad Magazine's maddest writer, coming up at 47 after the hour to uh, give us our gadget of the week. But first, Scott in San Diego. Hi, Scott. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. How are you today? Fantastic. How are you? Excellent down here in San Diego. A little warm. Ah, uh, show off. <laughs> what can I do for you today? Yeah, uh, iMac. It's, uh, you know, a year old running uh, Snow Leopard upgraded to Lion. And uh, I Googled this problem, and I'm seeing a lot of people having the same problem. But my Wi-Fi went away, and when I click on the... Uh... Bad Lion. We'll talk about it. Bad Lion when we come back. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Bad Lion. We're going to try again. Say hello to Dick DiBartolo, Mad Magazine's maddest writer. Can you hear me, Dick? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Are you, are you surviving? Is Irene on its way? Well, you know what? It's coming uh, after midnight, and you did a gadget, Leo, a year ago this week that I'm going to talk about today because it is a big help to me right now. It is Dropcam. Oh, yes. We use I it in our studio. Drop, I took my Dropcam down to my boat. I, actually, I sent you an invite if you want to see the picture. From I do, it. yeah. So, so we can I watch your boat you sink later. Out. Later in the day, we'll be able to just watch it go right down. Oh, thanks! <laughs> well, the, uh, I plan to stay with my boat all the way to the bottom, like a good captain. <laughs> but the marina will be locked at six p.m., and all boat owners must evacuate the marina. And I thought, wait a minute. My drop cam, I'll take it out of my front window, run down, and put it on the boat. I hook the uh, router up to 12 volts, so it's running off the 12-volt battery. And I have it up here on another monitor. So even though I can't be there, if I see anything really happening, I'm going to run down and jump over the fence. It's rocking pretty good already. This is... It, it, it's this is just the uh, pre-storm. So the pre-storm. So the drop cam. Okay, this is cool. So the drop cam is on your boat itself in the marina. Yes, exactly. So I have it pointed so I can see the stanchion out front. Now you need Wi-Fi for this to get back to you. Is there Wi-Fi in the marina? Yes, there is. It comes in through the phone line. Perfect. So I have that, and way in the background. I, I hooked this up yesterday. I can tell when the Hudson's getting rough because I can see the white caps. Right. And it's really a great way. And, and the guy across the street from me, across the dock from me, walked by yesterday and he said, is, is that a camera in your window? And I said, <laughs> yes. He said, would, would, could I share that, that, that feed? Because you're, my boat's going to be in your view. So I said, oh, yeah, I'll send you an invite so you can... Uh, we do the same thing. You know, we had a drop cam watching our construction, and now it's just sitting there watching me work. But uh, I like drop cams. Now, drop cams, uh, how much? They're like 150 175 bucks. They're not cheap. $200. But you get audio and video, which I like. Right. Uh, uh, the sound version, I think, is 279 oh, okay. unless it's changed in the, in okay. the interview. It's a little more expensive for video. But I also like this feature. I can go back in time. So you can actually, if the boat sinks at midnight, you could scroll back to midnight and watch it over and over. Doom and gloom. <laughs> really? Don't you, ta don't you want to take your boat up and put it on, on blocks or something? Well... I, I, I sort of like the excitement of the storm, but I'm praying that it's not too exciting. You're thinking it might it might just blow over, so to speak. No. The problem will be if the storm surge is higher than 10 feet, Yeesh. the entire marina will rise off and right off those pilings and just go down river, all the boats hooked together. <laughs> so that if they go down river, w w could you pick them up in Brazil or something? 
Uh, I uh, pick them up at the Statue of Liberty. Oh, but okay. Look at this way. It's a 12 volt power. We can be watching it all the way down till they hit something. Oh, my goodness. This is a great idea. I actually love Dropcam. It's dropcam.com. We use it. It isn't cheap, but it, uh, because it uses Wi Fi, it's very easy to set up. Um, and I love the recording capability. Party, I had drop cam. You know, the uh, Jammer B and Alex let me go to your party uh, via Skype, but then they hooked up drop cam because I had my own tray in front of my TV set. And I could see what people were eating, and they would put it on my tray, and I could see it in the drop cam. So it was great. It was great. By the way, drop cam is not waterproof. You do know that. No. No, and it should not be used outdoors in an unprotected area. So you ha it's actually inside the boat? It's actually behind my windshield. Oh, that's good. Well, Dick, I really, I'm seri I've been facetious, but I sincerely hope there's no damage either to the boat or to you. And uh, take care, okay? Okay. Dick DiBartolo, you're going to go to his website, gizwiz.biz. Now, this drop cam is not a public drop cam, uh, so it, not everybody can see this. But, oh, okay, you know what? Uh, or is it? Is it public? public uh, uh, you know, I didn't think, I don't know if I made it public or not, but I, I will. There's no right. downside, right? Not to you. <laughs> <laughs> when you send 5,000 people to watch it, uh, <laughs> drop, drop cam may not be too happy because they heist it on their site. We, but we did that with ours, and I think we had quite a few viewers uh, watching. You know, I'm amazed oh, there, is no, there are no sunbathers out there on the boats. No, there are none. And this, this is the last chance to play the What the Heck Is It? I thought I'd throw that oh, in. Oh, yeah, please do. Gizwiz.biz is his website. It's a chance to win an autographed copy of Mad Magazine. And what do you do, Dick? It ends on Thursday. Uh, ends Wednesday night is the end of the month. Oh, gosh. So, so uh, go to gizwiz.biz, click the What the Heck Is It? contest button. And there are 12 Mad Magazines for the right answer, but, but 24 for the cleverest answer. And you do get Dick's great autograph. I just love this. Thank you, Dick. Please stay safe, okay? Thank you, sir. And we'll talk again soon. Actually, if, if the connection holds up, we'll do our uh, daily Gizwiz, weekly daily Gizwiz show uh, right after the radio show. I'm not sure the connection's holding up too well, to be honest with you. Well, well, well call me back when you're ready. I don't understand. I really don't understand. What's the problem? Why can't New York keep a decent Skype connection up in the middle of a hurricane? <laughs> Thank you, Dickie D. Thank you all for being here. Do, if you're on the East Coast, please stay safe. Stay inside. Evacuate if required. Leo Laporte, the tech guy.